Good afternoon, everybody. Howdy. Um, just real quick, uh, I, I gave this talk as a practice um, about three weeks ago, and there were some common questions that came up I thought I would address uh, before I jump into the slides. Um, real quick, my name is John. Um, I do not know what internal CTO means either, but I typically help organizations build security practices, and I help them with uh, remediating their architectural problems. One of the, the most common questions uh, that came up is, what is this? Um, yes, I am going as a 70s porn star for Halloween. Um, and second, uh, you know, the question was, are you here just to sell us your custom fabricated really um, silly password storage solution? Uh, no, the reason I'm here is for Movember. Um, if you don't know what Movember is, it's a charity thing where you shave your whole uh, beard, mustache, whatever you got, and you grow it back in whatever style you want. I was thinking Burt Reynolds. Uh, and so I created a no wasp team, misplaced stash. So uh, it's for a good cause, uh, it's very exciting. Um, and uh, so I, I encourage you to either donate or participate. Uh, this is my advertisement. Uh, if you look at me during the presentation, you'll be reminded uh, to sign up. <laughs> and yes, I feel silly. Okay, um, this, is, this will likely become a dialogue. Uh, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, first and foremost, I want to uh, raise the level of discussion we're having about uh, uh, storing passwords. In general, to me, password tra uh, transfer over the web and password storage is kind of like riding a motorcycle. It's intrinsically not safe. It's not the right strategy if you want to be safe. Uh, but if you insist on riding a motorcycle, uh, we should probably give you some sort of body armor and helmets. This is not really a conversation about what body armor and helmets you should wear. There are various brands. Uh, but I want to elevate the discussion, and in particular, since I've talked about threat modeling so much, um, elevate the discussion in that regard. Let's look at what's actually happening with the primitives we're using. Let's look at how they can be attacked. And regardless of what you do, uh, make sure that you can defend your position get it past your architects, uh, and make sure when and if your passwords are stolen that you can deal with that situation. So that's what this is about. Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, history, uh, understanding where we've come from and how we're here. Uh, we started really getting uh, wound up about passwords circa 1973, uh, which was before I was born. Um, and we were using DES, and what's interesting about DES is that uh, it was modeled to try to drive through a few iterations about a one second execution time in terms of calendar, real, real calendar time. Uh, and so we're going to see this meme propagate uh, through 2012. Uh, we stored these passwords in Etsy password, we had one way encrypted them, uh, and we made this file world readable because we wanted when the users to log in their UID to be able to check uh, that the password was correct so we could log them in or deny them. So all of you ought to be able to uh, blow through these slides. What is wrong with this particular scheme for storing passwords? Other than the fact that Nicki Minaj and Bob Cat weren't alive then either. Just shout it out. Oh my god, there's tons wrong, right? <laughs> But if you, look at, if you look at my password hash, where else do you see it? Sorry, it's not a hash. It's root, and so what does that mean? They're the same, oops, I don't have animation anymore, outstanding. Um, so that means that our passwords are the same, and that means if I read this file, that I can log in as root using my password. This is a problem. Um, and that brings us to 2012. Uh, what do we see here? This is Yahoo's. Um, stolen file with some modifications. And honestly, it was this file that caused me to create this presentation. Um, because there was some internal chatter in my OWASP chapter, and there was some internal chatter inside of my company, uh, regrettably, saying, well, these are salted. You can see the salts out front, but the salts are different lengths. That's weird. Is this shot one? Is it something else? What's going on? So what do we see here? What do you think this is? How would you figure out how these passwords are protected? How many are LinkedIn members here? 
So yeah, my, my friend, he works for Northrop Grumman, he said, you know, the real uh, discovery here is that, you know, 5.4 peop million people use LinkedIn. That's the real. So I have a LinkedIn account. So what I did is I took my password, uh, I sha wand it, and then I grepped this database for it. And what I did is I grepped the database for it, uh, basically with the chunk behind these five characters. And what do you know? I found my hash with the prepended five characters. Now, why, why are these five, uh, is that assault? The answer is no, it's not assault. But what it is, is the, 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 um, the testers that broke this took the, the, uh, the weakest passwords, those that were the most easy to brute force, and prepended five zeros to them to protect the victim. So what that meant was that my password was very easily cracked, which it wasn't password, but uh, it was roughly similar. It should give you a feel for how much I value my LinkedIn account. Um, <laughs> so this is what happens when you work for a company for 15 years. You don't apply for jobs very much. So um, in the news, LinkedIn, IEEE, Yahoo, it was fascinating. Uh, on my way to discuss this in my OWASP chapter, the Wall Street Journal called and was like, do you have any quotes for uh, the Yahoo hack? And I said, what? No, don't, don't. Uh, so it literally, every time I have talked on this topic, except for today, there has been a break. Um, and so, you know, to me, this kind of indicates that uh, your passwords will probably be extracted. Now, whether or not it's publicized, that's a different question. But I think when we architect our systems, we have to come to the conclusion that we need to be resilient against this kind of theft. Protecting ourselves and preventing it is probably going to be more challenging than we're, we're cut out for at the moment. So step one is, is try, to, you know, try to protect better than these guys have. So don't be on the cover, you know, the cover of some magazine. And two, perhaps more importantly, uh, if your passwords are stolen, uh, make sure you have a great story um, that you can deflect this problem. Uh, so being who I am, I went uh, ultra sort of pedantic on this and created a 38-page threat model, which is a Google Doc, which is available to anyone in the OWASP domain. Uh, I broke it down into two different sections. Um, stealing and acquiring the database of passwords and then breaking those passwords uh, however they're protected and reversing the actual credentials out of them. Uh, I ordered the attack vectors by difficulty. I created threats of various different types. T1 is the classic application security concern, the internet, internet based threats. There are victims, there are, there are hapless victims, victims, targeted victims. There are men in the middle, T2, and then there are insiders, T3. Um, this is terribly uninteresting. We're going to get to the, the meat of it. But uh, if you want, um, you know, Friday's coming up, you can get a, a bottle of wine or a bottle of scotch, whatever your pleasure is, get these 38 pages and cry yourself to sleep. Um, <laughs> the current industry practices really haven't changed that much since 73, to be honest. Uh, we've used different f of x, but the f of x's are very similar in nature to two forms. Uh, and we still, when we do assessments, see all of the things listed here, plain text, encrypted uh, passwords, hashed, salted and hashed, adaptive hashes. Uh, what I found when I started talking about what you should do is that people didn't know what the cryptographic primitives do do. Uh, it's a do do. Um, and, and so I thought that there was an important primer uh, in understanding the, the properties, the security and privacy properties of the primitives because without that, we're going to have a shouting match about whether you like your religious solution or mine better. Um, and so we need to go through the properties of a hash. So what are some properties that hash functions have? One way. I'm sorry, they're one way. Man, diffusion is what that's called. Small changes in the input create large changes in the output. And that's the last thing on here because everyone forgets it. Others. They're lightning fast. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> they should be collision resistant. So presumably, hashes are unique uh, uh, on the output space. Presumably, they are deterministic in terms of the transform. So A will always hash to the same value. B will always hash to the same value. And that those, those, um, uh, those, those, uh, those transforms should be collision resistant. In other words, no A and no B should, should collide with the same output. Um, they should be non-reversible or one way, which was the first thing that was said. They should be unpredictable. 
So if I add like one or mask the input, uh, you know, I can create these some of these properties, but it, it's predictable. And then diffusion. Um, I actually don't have speed on here. That's outstanding. Um, ah, there we go. They're lightning fast. And so this is the problem that really gets uh, our shorts in a bind regarding protecting passwords with this, right? Because if we have a one-way function that has determinism and collision resistance, all of these are great ways to store and protect uh, a password. But if you have a password dictionary, you can run the function in a lightning fas uh, fast fashion, and then you can brute force the space and reverse the password. So uh, we don't like hashes, uh, naked hashes anyways, for protecting passwords for that reason. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, go on. I, I guess we're done here. Uh, <laughs> woo! Yeah, um, do the arrow the right way? Right. So is the solution just to use a better hash? We can go to SHA-2. There's various different forms of that. We just came out with SHA-3. Is this the answer? No, forever, yeah. Uh, no, this is not the answer. So what property, did it, property in the last slide did these hashes affect compared to the, to the SHA-1? Collision resistance. Collision resistance. So they have a, they have a, a, a larger output uh, space. And so in theory, with uh, you know, uh, the, the fixed input space, there should be less collisions. Um, but this, was this the problem we had on the last slide, or was it the speed? It was the speed. So this doesn't solve the problem. Now, it's OK if you thought that this was going to be a fix. I'm surprised at how many people uh, think about this. It's not the fix. And so I think it's valuable. If you understand hashes, that's fine. This last slide was a waste. Uh, but regardless of what cryptographic primitive you're using, it's important, I think, when you're evaluating as a solution to a problem to write out those properties explicitly and consider how they're going to affect the security and privacy issues uh, of, of, your, of what you're attempting. So. Um, the question then becomes, okay, so this is how people are storing this stuff. How can we attack uh, these problems? So uh, as I typically do, I believe that that is a threat model specific question. So I broke this down into four classes of things. 15 year olds at home in their boxer shorts, uh, application security professionals such as ourselves with a decent toolkit um, for attacking, well equipped attackers, people who can do GPU and FPGA uh, acceleration, and then people who can do all of those things and have an acre of CPU to throw at it. So the, the nation state or the well-equipped um, uh, concerted threat. We're going to focus most of our time on the middle two because the top one is really boring um, and the bottom one is almost impossible to defend against. Um, also, uh, some of you are probably in the business of protecting against nation states. Um, many of you are not. Uh, if you are in the business of protecting against that, you probably need a, 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 a solution that I cannot uh, simply present to a, a, a group of subjects. The claim I hear that S script, because it takes up so much memory, defeats all the massive parallelization that optimization states that are the problem. It is indeed the solution to all problems. And uh, last weekend I had it uh, actually tattooed on my left arm. <laughs> so uh, that's later. I can only rip this once. Um, <laughs> That is where I tattooed it, but I described a, an alternative location for the B-Crypt tattoo, that's correct. So, what was the original comment? Oh, what was the original comment? <laughs> Doesn't S-Crypt solve all these problems because it's memory hard? It is also CPU hard, but uh, we will get to that. We will get to that in um, a profound and gory uh, detail later. Um, so, uh, okay, so what attacks uh, do these people have uh, available to them? If you remember the attack vector slide, there's basically dictionary attacks. Um, uh, uh, fully exhaustive brute force attacks. Uh, the next kind of attack is, 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 a, is a rainbow table attack. Um, and these are attacks that an AppSec professional may not know today, but uh, can go to things as lame as Wikipedia and drive through to completion in about a week. Um, the net of all of these attacks is that they trade off one of two things, speed or CPU and space. So you have two choices once you steal the database. You can plow through it with CPU and try to break it, or you can do that over time before you steal the database, and you can look it up in a table. Um, I have hidden slides that talk about the size of um, you know, the, 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 the brute force tables. Um, and uh, if you want to see, there's, there's like 30 slides in this presentation. There's like another 30 slides hidden uh, that go through other 
footnotes and, and, and other sizing or speed requirements. We've done a lot of testing on this because uh, on, the, on the mailing lists and so forth, people throw out all kinds of things like you could never break this, you need this much space to break this. Most of what they've said is wrong. Uh, so we've done the research, um, footnoted the research, and then threw it in here. Um, most of the time we haven't done it, we've, we've relied on other people have done it. So, uh, but I think rainbow tables are particularly interesting to talk about because almost everyone I've heard talk about them uh, in this space uh, has totally misinterpreted what they are. So a rainbow table is an attempt to combine this space and speed trade-off uh, in a single tool. So if you're going to exhaustively look at you know, passwords that are extremely long, particularly longer than nine characters, and then have a variety of dimensions to the character sets that can make up those characters, it's going to take too much, one second, too much uh, space to hold them. So a rainbow table is basically a hash chain scheme. Uh, and if you're interested, again, that's another great bottle of wine uh, Friday night activity. Um, that basically allows you to chain the hashes together so that each, um, uh, you know, you may have to try multiple times to get through a single chain, but you can save a, a lot of space in holding the whole table. And so the colorization of this is a little bit confusing, uh, but basically there are dictionary tables for particular operating systems and the protection schemes as operating systems use, and this describes the number uh, in terms of space that they require for each of the dimensions in each of the, um, the password lengths. I'm sorry, go ahead. So in fact, when I, um, so the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, when I, when I, <laughs> when I shod my, um, my LinkedIn password, I also uh, Googled the hash. And it came up in a, in a, in a it was a Russian site, but it was a dictionary. So I could have reverse looked up that stuff. Uh, and I didn't even have to use my disk with someone else's. Now, interestingly enough, Vista. Oh, I'm sorry. I got You've asked that twice, and now I'm not going to screw up ever again. I'm going to repeat the question. <laughs> so uh, the question was, um, what was the question again? <laughs> so he got the same. Uh, it was basically um, there are uh, hash tables. Uh, I'm sorry, there are dictionary tables uh, and rainbow tables available for SHA-1. Are there uh, tables available for other things? And the answer is yes. In fact, uh, this is from Offcrack, and I, again, I have all the notes in the slides and the URLs. But basically, if you look at Vista, Vista does not use a SHA-based scheme. It's a different scheme, and these are rainbow tables available uh, for that scheme. Um, outstanding. So um, uh, this is the same thing in text, which is redundant. Uh, so the next thing we think to do after we, we, we hash is that we salt. And so what does the salt do for us? Well. The salt solves the problem on that first slide, right? It deduplicates uh, the same passwords stored as uh, either ciphertext or hashes. And this is interesting. It's, it's, it's caveat here because this is important. It increases the entropy required to drive through the brute force space, but only if you're looking at the whole password population. If you're going after a particular user's password, it does nothing to increase the entropy. Why? Because the salt, by definition, is prepended to the digest text. And if you've stolen the database, you've stolen the salt. You pull it off the front. You run your calculation with it. So it's valuable to increasing that time because it forces you to do the online CPU-based thing as opposed to the, the, um, the stored attack. Uh, but it also uh, only really prevents you uh, from brute forcing the space if you've got a population. Do you think you have to use like salt isolation where you put half the salt the database? I have three slides on that. Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so what's fascinating to, to me is that when I look at, at real world production systems of Fortune 500s, I'm surprised at how infrequently they, they salt the, um, uh, their, their, their whatever, their scheme. Um, and so I'd like to introduce you to this notation, which is um, standard or non-standard, depending on your point of view. Uh, you know, prepend the salt to the plain text, throw it through the hash function, and store the digest with the salt prepended to it. So, outstanding. It's a little bit nonsense. So, um, so can the salted uh, hashes be attacked? And I just went over this. So, if you, if you jack the database, uh, you can do a CPU-based run on one user's password because you have the salt. If you have to plow through the whole po population and the website has more than 10 users, then, uh, you know, the population and the differences of the, of the salts for each user um, will probably prevent you. 
Some organizations have gone to a salt-based system, but they've used the same salt for every user on the site, <laughs> which I'm excited by because that has nearly precisely zero effect. It does have a slightly positive effect in as much as it does invalidate the previous uh, rainbow or, 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 or hash tables, um, but they can be recalculated relatively quickly. Um, and so what we're gonna start to do is we're gonna start to look at what a well-equipped attacker can do and how we're gonna prevent them. Because we've kind of gone through the some guy application uh, security professional, and I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this slide, but I wanna uh, show you it. Basically, the gist of it is, um, with a few hundred dollars, you can bang through um, relatively commonly length passwords, eight or nine characters, uh, in a relatively short amount of time. And this is with garden variety, um, garden variety uh, graphics cards which, in, in case you're not aware of how these work, they typically have between 160 and 320 uh, parallel processing units on them. So it just suffice it to say that most of the laptops that you guys brought can try between uh, three and six billion uh, SHA-1 uh, uh, digests per second. And so when you think about dictionary or full space brute force attacks, you know, I, I think we can conclude relatively easily that uh, those kind of hashes are insufficient to handle the problem. So let's move on to my tattoo. So the solution to this problem was the adaptive hashes. And these are algorithms designed specifically to avail themselves of all of the positive properties of hashes, but remove that lightning fast thing. Okay, because that was really what was causing us to burn. Uh, and this thus protects us from both brute force and these kind of table-based attacks because each password attempt that the attacker makes is moving back up towards that one second that Des originally took when we logged into our Unix box in 1973. So it, these, um, these, these approaches do this by iterating uh, the hashing function. And they do other really interesting and fun things which we'll describe uh, superficially here um, if you would like to discuss uh, further. Of, you know, we can do that, but uh, I'm going to need a, a bourbon. So the first, um, the first such uh, uh, adaptive hash is PBKDF, PBKDF2. It's a family. Um, again, all of the um, all of the the resources for this uh, are here. This is simplified. It's in red. It is all caps. Um, I I imagined. Uh, I, I almost did an exclamation point. It's simplified. It's simplified. This is not the exact algorithm. I'm not claiming that it is. Okay, we got that? So what basically this does is you, you get a salt, um, you pick a C, which is the number of iterations, it's your work factor. Um, you pass the salt and the password to PDKDF, you also pass the output length that you want, uh, and you get a protected password back, and you store that with the salt appended to it. Um, how does this work? Uh, this is simplified, this is not the actual algorithm, um, but you basically run this thing in a loop, and then you do some fancy things to mix the blocks together because that provides you uh, very advantageous properties to prevent more interesting cryptanalytic attacks. We're not going to talk about the more interesting cryptanalytic attacks because we're only focusing on that well-equipped equipped attack or not the concerted nation state. So the problem with this function, if there is one, is that we have to pick a good C. Um, and uh, so we have to basically you know, size this thing. So NIST says 1,000, iOS 4 uses 10,000. It's been said that it requires 10 million to be secure uh, today on modern hardware. That's an open question, and you've gotta, you know, you've gotta work that out if you're going to use this function um, in your environment. Um, okay, so there are positives and negatives to this, but we'll get to them later. The advantage to the, oh, one more thing to say about PBKDF before I move on to the other adaptive hashes. Um, the spec is slightly ambiguous on this, 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 this topic. If you look at the body of the, of the spec, it says you can use any PRF. In this case, you see it's uh, SHA HMAC. Um, in the appendix uh, of, of the spec, it says you can use any. So some people you will talk to about PBKDF say, well, you can, you can use SHA2, and that makes it better, and they'll, they'll, they'll end up with a variety of arguments. If you use the JCE, it does in fact have a generic implementation and then in the call to the function it go ahead and checks the, the string to see if you're using uh, SHA-1 and if uh, you're not then it throws an exception. 
so the reality is, regardless of the spec ambiguity, most implementations hard code SHA-1. Um, so that's that. They have, the shell one is hard coded into Java 5 and beyond. So, that's correct. So the question is, what is the effect of the security of using a low grade hash uh, when, you use the, when you use these rounds? Um, and uh, presuming, the, the answer is, well, um, the answer for the concerted attacker is, um, if you have a problem with the distribution and output, um, the diffusion property, uh, then you may be able to do uh, special interesting attacks. Um, most of these uh, functions that are implemented uh, prevent things like length, length extensions and, and things of that nature. Um, a lot of the security is coming from the C, the work factor. Um, so to the threat we're talking about, it's mostly just picking the right C. Um, that is not strictly speaking if you have someone who, who has some crypto analytic capabilities. Um, I would push this onto the stack and we can talk about it afterwards because it is an interesting concern. Um, but we're going to move on for the sake of, of time and you can harass me about that. Absolutely. So if PPKDF is not the answer, then perhaps it's Bcrypt. And there, there are many people who feel um, uh, immensely passionate, passionate about the use of Bcrypt. Uh, Bcrypt has a similar interface to PPKDF2, um, but under the hood it's very different. Whereas, this, whereas PPKDF is is basically an iterated hash function. This is actually an encryption uh, with a um, with a, uh, a CPU hard um, uh, key generation scheme. And so what you see is that um, what it does is it takes a, a sort of basically uh, a known plain text here at the bottom, uh, and it uses Blowfish to uh, to a particular work factor expand the key, and then it encrypts um, that key. Uh, I'm sorry, this known plain text with that derived key. One of the big differences, uh, other than this structure, this is much more like DES in, in structure than the, than the hash based PBKDF is. Uh, one of the, the differences in this is that the work factor in PBKDF is linear, the work factor in Bcrypt is exponential. Um, so when you increase C, you get more bang for your proverbial buck. Uh, another interesting difference in Bcrypt. Uh, from PBKDF is that it returns a structured output, which is interesting. It appends the work factor, the salt, and the digest together so you can store that. And there's tremendous value in doing this. When you prepend the work factor to the, the digest, if the application server goes down, if the uh, developer is hit by um, a bus, if any number of things happen, you know how that thing was protected, and you can attempt to verify it later, um, even if that kind of, because that information is recorded here whereas that is not the case here. So there's some argument as to whether or not um, you know, this cost is enough at base um, or what the right cost is. This is certainly not supported by the JCE. That is a huge problem for my customers. And uh, another problem, oddly enough, is that they don't want to use blow, uh, Blowfish either. Um, and so you know, uh, you've you got to download it from some guy's website. Um, and, and you know, certain organizations don't want to stand for that. They want it in the JCE, uh, they want it supported, and so on and so forth. Um, it does mostly uh, resist GPU uh, parallelization, though uh, that is falling apart, um, but slowly. Uh, but it certainly does not uh, resist FPGA uh, parallelization. Um, so a lot of the argument between Bcrypt and PBKDF, honestly, because the, you can adjust the work factors to be equivalent, is basically the support you get in, uh, in, your, in your either Java or .NET packages. So uh, almost all of the pushback I've received from using Bcrypt in, in, in production environments is, is the support. Uh, so if you don't have that problem, uh, this is maybe uh, you know, a lovely option for you. Um, Scrypt uh, is, is, is Bcrypt++ plus plus in as much as Bcrypt++ plus plus, uh, was, or uh, PBKDF++ plus plus was uh, Bcrypt. Uh, Scrypt adds a few more factors. Uh, let's not talk about R. It's basically internal uh, block size. But basically, Scrypt allows you to adjust the CPU hardness of the algorithm, but also the memory hardness of the algorithm. 
and we can talk about that afterwards if you're really interested. Uh, the S script paper is absolutely something you should attempt to read and understand. It is rather um, difficult as compared to the others. Um, this is a tragic oversimplification of it, but um, basically the gist of it is that it does really fancy things to set up a matrix and really mix the output of another adaptive hash to the KDF2 uh, together and use a profoundly larger amount of memory. Um, if you know anything about GPUs, you can store it in the registers, you can store it in the local memory, which is about 32K, or you can go out to the PCI bus, uh, and that, that, is, that is just, you know, orders of magnitude slower. And so S-Crypt really succeeds in trumping both PBKDF and Bcrypt uh, in terms of its ability to resist parallelization, to your question, Jim. Um, there's, there's a good paper on that. I have both of them listed in here as links and at the end. Um, <laughs> uh, I was thinking of a, uh, of a metaphor for relating these. I'm going I'm to leave it alone. Though. So what are the properties of these? Why would you use them? Well, they resist most threats attacks, except for the, the nation state, state attacks. So I think that's probably good enough for 99.99% of the population. Um, they're very simple implementations. You saw the APIs for these things. You download a jar, you download an assembly, you get a library off the C compiler. Uh, you basically call one function, and lickety split, uh, you're there. Um, and that's good, that's great. Um, they, sca um, they scale CPU difficulty with a parameter, but we, we struggle to figure out what that parameter is. So there are some limitations to this as well. Um, remember I said that there were three purposes. We want you to be able to articulate what you're gonna do. We want you to be able to get it past your architects and into production. And then when you get busted, you want to be able to uh, resist, I'm um, sorry, be resilient against that attack. So uh, my experience with architects is when you sit down and explain to them that you have a, uh, a solution to the problem and it's to do something very similar to the former solution, but do it 10 million times, you have just slipped into the definition of insanity which is doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, and while it's perfectly valid to increase the work factor, uh, it's, it's sometimes a challenge to articulate. Uh, also, uh, this can create a problem because of the lack of the support in the toolkits in heterogeneous architectures, um, where, where you, can't, you don't have availability of the, of the APIs. And in fact, S-Crypt is, 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 is sort of increasingly less supported by um, implementations that have been well vetted and have gone through all the test vectors than even Bcrypt. Um, just because we can play with C does not mean we have the ability to be resilient. So imagine this, you set C to one million, you think you're good, you throw the stuff in production, the database gets stolen, your, your plain text passwords show up on the net. What do you do? You can't just change C, what does that mean? You have to change C in development, promote that stuff through, some of you are very agile, that'll happen quickly. What do you do with your production data? Do you basically set up the equivalent of a brute force attack, tear through your database and iterate this stuff? Do you have to set some sort of uh, block in your login code to make sure that you're checking against the previous hash scheme or the, the current one? So the most important thing, honestly, you can do to have a good story, as far as I'm concerned, on password storage, is be able to deal with the, the, the eventuality that it can be stolen without having to make code changes, design changes, and then database changes. Um, so this C thing seems, when we think about it as a security guy or uh, maybe a, just a, you know, a sort of a unit developer as a solution, but there's much more to it. Um, the other thing is that I think we need to obtain, in addition to the fact that I don't want to do the same thing over and over again and call it a solution, I think we need to obtain asymmetric warfare in order to declare success. So if I'm using bcrypt or scrypt, I'm costing the attacker one second, one half a second per try. But I'm also costing my servers that much for every user that they log in or every user they unsuccessfully log in. And I don't like, personally, this is just me, any solution that costs me as much as my adversary. Because, you know, I don't want to be in a cat and mouse game. I want a situation under which I am, I am paying a small price as compared. Uh, and I already talked about number four. So let's look at what the defender versus the attacker really means and let's look at this asymmetry or how we can produce asymmetry. This is the crux of it. This is the most important thing with respect to the architect and the solution, in my opinion. So the goal for the defender is to log in a user without spending more than a second delay. Now, the attacker has a very different goal, and this is very hard for some security guys to understand. They may need to crack only one single password out of the whole database. So LinkedIn, uh, you know, these password databases were on the order of seven figures, small seven figures, two to five million. But they only need to crack one of them. Now, if you're going after a particular user, like the admins, 
then you may have a more difficult task. Um, or they may be trying to break 10 of them, like in the case of, of LinkedIn, to have a media event. But those are three very different average and worst case uh, break times. And so we have to think about that within our threat model as we compare the solutions. Uh, and the solutions will, in fact, compare very differently based on those objectives. So the, the, the way that that scales is based on rate and burden. So one of the clients I'm working with has 55 million users, 20 million active users at any time, 2 million active login attempts successful per hour. So that isn't a lot or a little, but it's what they have to support. Um, they have 4 to 16 CPUs per application server, and they have 2 to 64 uh, servers per, per uh, retail banking portal. In this case, they have eight CPUs per server and 16 servers in their uh, deployment. So the success gauge, as far as I'm concerned, is when we change their SHA-1 implementation to another implementation, like an adaptive hash, how many more machines are they going to have to buy and deploy? Because I'm going to cost them more CPU. Or more memory, or both. So the attacker has a different arc, right? So the attacker, they can scale um, they can scale their hardware uh, with, the, with the, um, the value of their prize that they break. And really their burden is that they're bounded by, they have unlimited time to do the break. They're bounded by how long it takes the users to reset their passwords. And if they don't communicate that the password database has been stolen and the organization has no ability to audit and monitor that, that could be truly an infinite amount of time depending on the password reset um, uh, policy. So you know, what we have is a situation in which a population of, of uh, 20 million users uh, divided by two, if I tear through that thing, I ought to be able to get a break on average in about 10 million users, worst case 20 million. Uh, so my success gauge here, but I have different hardware with which I can do that. I have FPGAs and, and, and GPUs. So the success for the attacker is how many days it takes to pop the password. Yeah. Um, it, it would be um, if I couldn't do this with commodity hardware to some extent. So people have done some um, people have done some really, and I, they're they're in the notes of the slide. Some some analysis on how much it costs to do this with uh, Amazon, and Amazon is particularly cost ineffective to do your password hacking because their GPU time is so much more expensive than their CPU time. Um, I had a machine at home with like you know three graphics cards, and I was I was perfectly constrained by the speed of my PCI bus which is only 169 gigabytes per second. And so I literally could not feed passwords from my, my file to the GPUs to break them fast enough. Um, my PCI bus was throttling it. So um, if, if, but you can make slight modifications to that hardware scenario and to your code to overcome those problems. And it may cost you twice as much. But you can control that cost variable. So to me, like, to me, and you could argue either way, but to me the barrier is, you know, if I use commodity hardware, how, you know, a good application security professional has a decent machine, let's say $10,000 worth a year, right? So, you know, the average, um, the average defender has what I'm describing here. So I'm just going with averages. Now these, these things can scale up or down. Here's what's interesting, these are variables. So I created a, a spreadsheet to describe these variables because you know what, your, your attacker is going to have a particular set of capabilities and your server farm is gonna look different and your user base is gonna look different. So these numbers are just my client, okay? So uh, your numbers will be different. So I thought, well the best thing to do is create a spreadsheet and give you guys the spreadsheet and you can run the numbers and you can set those values equal to whatever you want. I don't care. So what I did was I thought, let's go back to 1973. So let's target this thing for one second, okay? And I, I put all of those factors on the previous slide in, and this is totally fascinating. So we can argue about whether or not I can do a bcrypt round in you know, a tenth of a second or, you know. The bottom line is that I can do it about twice as fast uh, on a GPU as I can do it on a CPU. So I worked that work factor into the 10 million population and the average thing. And so what I came up with a graph of both of these things, the attacker and the defender, and what I found was at one second per vcrypt uh, login, uh, it would take 35 machines, uh, not eight or 16, uh, to accomplish login at full CPU load, which of course these authentication machines are doing other things, 
So I'm a bit concerned about that. I'm, I'm really asking them to make a big change to their production environment and really scale that up. What's interesting about this is that the same one second for the attacker with this commodity hardware, 2x on the GPU, again, home-based systems, is, six, is less than 60 days. So, so Jim is a baseline with commodity hardware. The inflection point is interesting. At a second, you have, I gotta buy 32, you know, I gotta buy 24 more machines for my customer, go through burning, that's three months, by the way. Uh, go through testing, that's another three months. I'm six months away and 24 more machines away from the solution and three months, six months, the attacker is 55 days away, right? So I have not achieved asymmetric warfare and I have made no onerous assumptions in making this trade-off. You can make as onerous or as, as aggressive assumptions as you want in the spreadsheet. So I don't like these adaptive solutions naked because I don't think they provide asymmetric warfare and I think they have a particular problem that iteration count that again naked on its own is gonna cause me with my, my architects. If you're using bcrypt or scrypt or pbkdf2, that's fine. You need a good story to explain it to your organization. Um, I'm not against them, I'm not for them, I just work here. Um, yeah. Very common. This is a work factor one. But remember, the work factor is baked into this calculation symmetrically. So if you change the work factor to 10, both of these numbers are gonna go up. And so what you have is it's gonna take 1.4 seconds to log in, which means you're gonna need 45 machines. And what you see is that you go to 1.4 and it's gonna take 70 days. So it's, ba it's baked into the calculation. Pick, pick what you want, I mean, smoke your own. So, um, I think that there's, uh, we can go back to threat modeling and we can go back to security architecture, which is the, uh, uh, my favorite saw. And we can start to use other properties to come up with different solutions. Uh, are the solutions better? Yeah, actually, they're kind of in an equivalence class, but they have different properties from an architecture and from a maintenance perspective. Let's look at defense in depth, let's look at compartmentalization, and let's look at separation of privilege. Uh, I believe that adaptive hashes are the best uh, to strengthen the system with a single control. I want to pause on that because people often say I just bash them. Uh, but I think we can do better with defense in depth. So we can use something like an HMAC. Now what is the difference between a hash and an HMAC? It requires a key which is going to, if we protect that key, presumably um, you know, talk to the identity of the person who computed the hash. Um, you're, allowed to, uh, you're allowed to heckle me, but other people have to give me solution answers. In the <laughs> wow, there you go. So, I was gonna say, you're not, you're not really trying out for the, uh, thank you, uh, for, for the, the big league for that one. Okay, so, right, um, you know, the motivation for using something like that is it does inherit the hash properties. The best hash property that HMAX inherit is the lightning speed. So we're getting the advantage back on the, uh, the defender side. Um, Outstanding. So, uh, but uh, it resists the threat's attacks because it provides this additional search space uh, in, the, in, the, in the key, which is additional entropy uh, to someone brute forcing a single password or the population. Um, here's, the, here's, the, here's the other advantage. It requires you to pull stuff out of the database and it requires you to pull stuff out of the application server. So now I'm forcing them to attack the database to pull the passwords and attack the key store. So are we done? We can just go home, this is easy. Just do this, right? Well, there are trade-offs. Protecting the key material really challenges developers. I can't really say that I've gone to an organization and be like, you know what, you got key management down, and so we're out. In fact, one of the things that, uh, that, that, that Tom, uh, last time I gave this presentation, said was the best, the most common place for the developer to store the, the key is in the database, at which point the compartmentalization has collapsed and I've got nothing yet. What, what about network HSMs? What about network, network HSMs? So, I think there's a role for the, that kind of, what about network HSMs? I think there's a role for products like HSMs to play in helping developers uh, protect keys. Uh, I'm pumped about HSMs uh, because anytime I can explain to the architect that there's a security product they can buy to help with the solution, I tend to grease the wheels, even though I'm not a product guy. Um, and that's slightly a... So it does push the problem uh, and it pushes it in, in really <laughs> annoying ways. 
the way that we usually describe this is it's turtles all the way down, right? At some point, you've got to trust something. If you're storing the key in an HSM, there's a way you connect and authenticate to that, so you've got to you know, protect that, uh, that credential. Uh, and, and I like the fact that I'm storing my um, passwords in the database, and I like that I'm storing something in the application server for the following reason, principally. Because a SQL injection or a backup or a tape-based attack on the database is fundamentally different than a break of the host, the key store, the HSM, or an RMI injection on the app server. And to my knowledge, I'm one of the few people that can actually pop RMI code in a remote machine, so I'm pretty happy with that solution. Um, but there's tons of ways to, to screw it up by putting the key in the database, by putting the thing in an HSM and sticking the, the key in the code and having it popped out with an exception or any number of things. This is not a panacea. It's a way to invoke defense in depth and compartmentalize. Um, I don't like this solution naked either, let's be clear. Uh, but if you were going to implement this solution, I think it's a good solution to implement if you're rolling with like a Java 4 or Java 5 environment and you need to use only FIPS certified primitives. Because the Java 5 environment doesn't even have PDKDF2. If you're not allowed to download and, and, and validate other jars, like Bouncy Castle was mentioned, you may be stuck with a solution like this because your policy states you can use nothing else. Uh, you still have to get other things right, and so on and so forth. So the question, Manico, was can't we just split the digest, or put another way, isn't just splitting the digest in two morally equivalent, quote unquote, to using an HMAC? Yes or no? Have I set the question up too obviously? No one voted. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is no, they're not the same. Um, you know, and remember the first example, right? I was able to discern that this was SHA-1. I was able to discern the scheme and find my password, even though they zeroed out the first five. This problem of diffusion is a mother, right, for these schemes. Diffusion means that a small change in the input makes a large change in the output, which means that the collisions on even a half, half hash are, in fact, incredibly unique. So I built a password database, well I downloaded one, it was 2.147 million passwords. Uh, they were all, all character sets, so uh, alphanumeric, um, caps, lower case, uh, and symbols. Uh, and then I split the digest in two. Well, why didn't you split the first bit off and leave the rest? Well, because two is the worst case scenario. And then I ran, um, uh, I ran uh, basically a collision check on that database, salted individually and uniquely, uh, and I came up with no collisions on PBKDF2, salted with, a, with a, um, uh, an 8-byte salt, uh, and I was able to crack these things at you know, hundreds a second. Um, and so I have a slide in the back where I, uh, if you want to get very excited about it, I have a slide in the back where uh, my test data exists, you can download my code, um, and you can try this on your own if you're, if you're into it. Again, very exciting way to spend a Friday night. Um, and so unfortunately, that solution is not really going to work for us very well. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting, right? I've seen a lot of security guys talk about this. So then what's the next answer, right? Well, do I split it in three? Do I split it in four? Do I put one in the database and one in the key store and one over here on the, you know, the file system? Yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm not sure if I understand that. Are you saying because you split the hash in half that because it's so diffuse, even with just half, were able to successfully when you brute force it, only compare half, the, there's, there's no collisions on the space. So if you get a match, it's a unique password match. And when you try that password, it will work. Oops. Right? So, um, and this is, this is like treading the line between the brute force attacks and the cryptanalytic attacks, right? And it's lowbrow cryptanalytic. But the point is that you need to list those properties out, like I said, so you can remember to test these things in your threat model or your misuse cases. Um, I don't like solutions that split the hash and get fancy like that because those aren't sort of approved cryptographic primitives and it starts to smell like the property of security by obscurity to me. Um, yeah. If you do this, great. Um, I'm not here to hate on anyone's design. So there is a reversible design. Um, and before you flip out that I put a reversible password storage design up there, this is actually quite similar uh, to what Mozilla um, suggests and actually uh, I have promised to, to work on the password storage uh, cheat sheet, and I have also started implementations of these things so that you can just call them and get the key store stuff right out of the box and make sure that it's not SQL injectable. Um, uh, and I also have 
uh, I'm sharing the, um, uh, the 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 breaker um, the, the the breaking experimentation interfaces so you can you can call those too, um, but so this reversible design has interesting properties. Let's say that we use an adaptive hash, uh, you know something like an S script or a PBKDF, uh, depending on whether or not you need it supported, and we do the same scheme we had before, uh, and then we encrypt that with a with a with a key with a wrapper key. So this provides us a different um, set of properties, and we still separate them into where they're storing them, so we have something here and something here. So this provides, um, this inherits all of the benefits of the previous solution, and it adds the adaptive hash slowness. This means that uh, this, this has a few positive benefits. Um, it still requires two kinds of attacks. It still requires the brute force, which is out of reach. And what's neat about this is if someone just steals the key out of your application server, because this scheme was reversible, you can just rotate that key. You can't do that with simply an adaptive hash uh, because you'd have to interact with the user. If someone steals the database and the key, they still have to brute force through the adaptive hash. Unfortunately, there are a lot of limitations to this. They're very similar to the previous limitations. You've got to get the key storage correct. Uh, you have to separate the, 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 the items, otherwise um, the internal threat can still bust you. Um, and quite frankly, this takes us from asymmetric warfare back similarly to symmetric. You guys are a much less belligerent audience than the last one I had, which I appreciate, but uh, you know. Okay, so the most important thing I think we can do, rather than talk about particular schemes, is talk about uh, how we're gonna deal with the operational impacts of these things. I talked about C. Uh, so step one is we need a way in our design to protect the user's account. So if my database or if my keys are stolen, I need a way to block login uh, and delete all of the shortcuts associated with login um, so that I can basically deal with the fact that some of my passwords are eventually going to be compromised. This may mean some sites like Facebook or your, your bank site may associate fingerprints with your machine, trust this machine, whatever, right? So I'm going to want to strip all of those shortcuts to log in away if my password database has been, has been yanked. A lot of systems have those shortcuts, but no way to revoke them. Uh, I'm going to want to integrate the new scheme, and I'm going to want to use those versions that I talked about in order to make sure that the data in my database can be incrementally upgraded, especially if I use an adaptive hash. Because of those 20 million users, they're all active, but I have 30 million other users that are database that are inactive. They may not log in for two years. If I have to tear through all 50 and do an online fix, I'm basically subject to the constraints of the brute force attack that the attacker has to do. So I do it incrementally, so I need a way to version what's been updated and what hasn't. Uh, this is actually a really clever trick um, that could augment the existing Mozilla guidance and improve it. Uh, if you use only a one-way scheme, one of the ways you can update the databases it's stored is basically to wrap that scheme in another either keyed hash or adaptive hash. So if you use SHA-1 right now, one thing you can do is just decrypt it and make sure that you get the version in the salt different and correct so you can differentiate the, uh, the digest texts. Uh, now, this does not help you prevent the brute force attack because wrapping an encrypted, a weakly encrypted thing with a strongly encrypted thing doesn't help when the weakly encrypted thing has already been stolen and someone's brute forcing it. But it is something you can start to say, well, we've updated our scheme and we've asked our users to reset their passwords, and so if this happens again, I feel like I have a better story. Aha, when the user logs in, I'm gonna need them to uh, change their password, but because the passwords are compromised, I'm gonna have to apply additional uh, checks to make sure that it's the user I'm talking, I think I'm talking to. That may be uh, out of band, uh, ex you know, exchange with their cell phone, it may be secret questions and answers, it may be so on and so forth. Uh, so just nailing this checklist of things I think is really important. And in fact, like I said, most systems would be hard pressed to implement these things uh, in retrospect uh, from where they currently are. I'm commuting with a ban now. Okay, so um, there's a ton more content in, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, there's a ton more interesting uh, you know, uh, gotchas and, and tricks underneath the hood. There's a ton more slides. Um, talking about the specifics, but I did want to keep it to an hour.